Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Really appreciate your, your attendance and your willingness to be a part of uh, this group. First of all, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Warren Greve, the Technical Director for Football New South Wales. I've been in my current position uh, as Technical Director for both male and female football for uh, just under a year now, but actually have been at Football New South Wales as a Technical Director for men's and boys for the last three years. So coming into the role, it was a, a very good opportunity for myself to understand the landscape of football within New South Wales and, and understand how vast and big New South Wales is with regards to football and, and the, not just in the amount of registered players, but how many players we've got, how many coaches we've got. And then within the associations, the associations that support both the players and the coaches, so tonight's presentation is really going to be about yourselves, the association that you're potentially within, and then how we want to try to support you uh, within your association, within your environment. Tonight will be very much be driven uh, by our, our project team that includes um, Ailey, Julia and Sam. And it's a really good opportunity for them to, to outline how we got to the point that we're currently at. This is our third presentation. Uh, that we've delivered in, in the last few weeks. And then also, we're really, really encouraged to also have the support of not only the associations, ourselves as the member federation, but also the governing body in the FA. So uh, we're really happy to, to have, uh, from a community perspective, uh, Debbie Fisher from the FA this evening, and also Charlotte as well from the Hills FA. And it's, it's going to be a great evening, I'm sure. And I will now pass you on to the team for the rest of the presentation and once again would like to thank you and hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. So um, look ladies thank you for being here tonight we're very excited um, to be here launching this network for community coaches um, in the hope that we can support you all and create future leaders in the game. I must say, uh, this is about 18 months in the making uh, with really hard work from the Women's Standing Committee at Football New South Wales, Football New South Wales staff and board members. It's a journey we hope will transform and lead the way in the coaching development space for many years to come. Who are the Women's Standing Committee at Football New South Wales? There's eight volunteers from different areas in New South Wales, um, Eastern Suburbs, uh, Gladesville Northwest, MacArthur, Southern Districts, Northern Suburbs, Illawarra, St George, Nepean and Canterbury Bankstown. We are supported by Football New South Wales Technical and Community Departments, as well as the board. We work on female football projects and issues impacting grassroots and representative football overall. The Coach Development Project uh, was our first passion project off the blocks. Um, our committee really resonated um, as we've all been coaches at one point or another. Five females on our committee are actually in the advanced coaching category and the rest have been community coaches. So this really gave us, um, you know, the depth and experience we need to lead, take action and also push forward for change in this space. Our amazing team, I'd love to introduce to you now, um, Ailey McKay, who's our chair of the Women's Standing Committee. She's also, well, she holds quite a few positions, I believe at Northern Suburbs but most notably um, head of female football. I believe she's an under 18s NPL one coach and also GSAP technical director. Um, myself, I'm also on the women's standing committee. Um, I hold a position at a grassroots club in the Eastern suburbs and also in MacArthur at Camden Tigers on the rep level. Um, Warren Grief, our amazing technical director um, who's been supporting this project with a lot of hard work to make this happen. And Sam, uh, our game development coordinator in the girls and women's space has spent countless hours making sure tonight happens. Um, our special guests, Debbie Fisher and, and Charlotte Ursel, have had a massive impact on the community space and both have had really inspiring journeys in all fac facets of the game, from coaching to administration, so they're really very much part of the team that's driving this project forward. And I really can't wait to hear their journeys um, in Ailey's Q&A. A bit of a personal note, um, I started in the community space about 18 years ago as a coach. 
So I really can't wait to work with you all on some level to collaborate and share stories. I really hope you take away some key points tonight that we're here to support you. Um, we already have inspired your associations to develop their own programs internally, to collaborate with your clubs and to ensure um, you know, that you guys are supported on the ground. I do hope you all get involved um, in your own associations. You take back your journey that you're about to go through here and inspire that next level of young coaches and others who may looking to start that, you know, their journeys. Collaboration at this level um, or any level is quite inspiring. Um, and you'll be really amazed at how much you get out of this by just being involved and being here. So thank you for being here. I know this is a massive step just to turn up tonight. And I really hope this is a start of amazing things for all of you. Um, so I'll hand you over to Sam, who's going to take you through the why, the how, and the overall strategy. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we're all very, very excited to, to launch this initiative and this project that we have, as Julia said, have been working on for a while now. So we want to start off by uh, talking through the why and how this kind of project came together. So as Julia explained, a lot of us involved are coaches ourselves. And I think the big thing when we were discussing this project that came out is that as coaches, we expect our players to develop and to be provided continuous opportunities. Uh, and when we looked at it, there's no reason why coaches shouldn't have the same. Coaches should also have opportunities to develop and as well as opportunities to progress in their career and to be supported. So that's where this why came about. So as a whole with the project, we have three key features that we're looking to, to uh, obtain. The first is we are looking to increase and attract the number of female coaches that are involved uh, at a grassroots level. The second is we're looking to develop these coaches at a grassroots level. And thirdly, we were looking to retain them and to try and keep female coaches coaching as long as we possibly can. So looking at this graph, at this diagram here, you can see that the numbers that are displayed are the number of female, uh, the percentage of females to males in all of the various associations. So that is from 2021. And then you can see on the side that we've got the uh, number of regional associations as well listed. The network is aimed to provide a safe environment for coaches to share and develop. So it is it, the aim of it is to be inclusive and we plan to collaborate these networks with the association. So there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of discussion between Football New South Wales and the associations to each network and each association has a program that is best suited to them. So now we'll look at the how and how the network comes about in relation with the association and with Football New South Wales. So just at the top, community coaches are to be mentored and supported by associations and inspire further into Football New South Wales groups. The Female Coaches Network is available to any coach who is recommended by their association and wants to further develop in their pathway. So the key there is that to be involved in this group, as I'm sure a lot of you have been and have started that process, you're here as you're referred by your association. Once we receive that referral, then there will be a link sent to a survey to complete, which I believe most of you have completed. If not, it is really critical that we do have that survey completed as that is how we can cater this group to best suit your needs and your wants and to see what exactly you guys would love to get out of this group. Once that survey is completed, you'll then receive an invitation to join the Football New South Wales Community Female Coaches Network. And once in there, you'll be able to be connected to various other coaches within that network. You'll receive communication, support and resources from Football New South Wales, technical directors, and as well as other coaches and association members. So our aim. The big thing to keep in mind here is that in 2023, we have probably the biggest or the biggest competition in female football, and that is the World Cup. So now's that time where we can really push female football as a whole 
for the next two years. So as Football New South Wales, we have an aim that we want to achieve an increase in female participation by 23% by 2023. And as you can see by the di in the diagram that we've got here, there are a number of areas in which we are looking to achieve that. And one being the female coach development project, which is what this will encompass. So the big question for us was how do we attract female coaches? How do we then develop these coaches and how do we retain? And our biggest takeaway so far from these survey results that we've collected is that providing support and opportunities to keep and increase the number of female coaches was the big ticket item. So whilst we've been able to grow in numbers, as you can see from the uh, previous years that we've got there, we've also noticed that whilst looking at the data, whilst the numbers have been increasing in terms of the number of coaches, the number of coaches leaving is also significantly large, which comes back to that retained piece. So we wanna keep those numbers growing as we work towards that 23%, but we also wanna keep the number of retained coaches high as well. So that's our aim, and that's what we're planning to achieve with this project. So it's not just a community, we're talking about the community space tonight. Hopefully what we'd like to see is in future as well is quite a few of you guys start to embark on that advanced pathway as well. And we want to keep female coaches in the game. Okay, so once you're in the network, um, as Sam already touched on, um, you will be receiving uh, thing, regular contact in, this, in the form of session plans, resources, discussion points, web links, and opportunities where um, you may be able to develop yourself um, further to where you are in your associations. So through the year, we're looking to have some online and face-to-face -face workshops and special events. Obviously, in the situation that we're in, um, we do have to, um, you know, combat different ways of meeting. So hopefully, uh, once we're all back on the ground, we can keep in touch, whether it's online, face-to-face, -face, and keep that support and communication going for all you round. All right. Um, evening, everyone. I just want to, I guess, reiterate what Sam and Julia's um, and, and Warren have said. Really excited to have you um, on the call. Um, and I guess in the community space, a lot of you um, have a little, like, lots of different experience when it comes to coaching. Some of you might be brand new. Some of you might be um, former players are getting into their coaching. Um, so. I guess it's really exciting um, and I guess a great belief of mine is we learn through stories and through collaboration. So um, we're going to, I guess, um, um, listen to and, and, and hear from two um, incredible female leaders in the game that have had vastly different um, journeys. So I guess that's a big thing I want you guys to take away tonight um, is um, we've all, I guess, got um, different journeys and, and it's very unique to us and, and where we're going. So if you can, um, can you jump and put your video on so I can see everyone's faces? Um, and we will, um, I guess, get started. So I guess uh, my journey really started with falling in love with the game as a, as a child. Um, I suppose as a child, I had a bit of an advantage because I grew up in Europe. Um, but came back to Australia when I was 14 and a half. So... I had a passion for the game um, from, from a young age and came to Australia and obviously everyone knows being 14 and a half, awkward teenage years and landing in a new country with a weird accent um, wasn't easy to, to sort of mix in, but again, found, found a football club locally. I had a female coach um, who was Scottish. Um, no. So there was an instant connection there, which I guess helped me to assimilate with life back back home in Australia. Um, I then went on to study a sports science degree, majoring in coaching, which, uh, although it was it was fabulous and, and I love it, I don't think it's a necessary thing to be a good coach. So I just want to put that out there that you don't need a degree in coaching to be a good coach. Um, so I did the, the sports science degree with a coaching major and then followed on with the 
diploma, postgrad diploma of education, which then kind of gave me access to schools, which um, again, timing is everything because it was around that period of time when I finished my degree and was doing a bit of casual teaching that the sports high schools really became a thing in Sydney. And I was lucky enough to land a position as um, the head coach or program director at Endeavour Sports High School. Um, so I continued to do that for quite some time, as well as playing, juggling playing and coaching. And, then, and I eventually got to a point where I loved coaching more than playing. Probably something to do with getting migraines, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I guess from a coaching journey perspective, um, probably my biggest challenge, which I've only really thought about more recently in full, filling out a, a different survey. Um, and I realised that as a female coach, getting married is a big no-no because <laughs> apparently then you're not capable of delivering coach education like you used to or indeed coaching a team because you're a female who's just got married, hence the assumption that you're going to go off and start a family, which, you know, in my situation didn't happen for another four or five years anyway. So, but on reflection now, when I look back at it and I go, oh, there was a distinct line in the sand there where people in positions of, of appointing coaches or coach educators made an assumption and I'm really hoping that that's not the case now <laughs> I'm really hoping we've learnt from that and women can be married they can be single they can have families they can have partners they can have whatever and still be good coaches and good coach educators um, so yeah that's that's a bit of my journey I've been in in this role as the girls youth development manager at football Australia for the past four and a half years um, I desperately miss coaching. So it's not a coaching role, but I do get the opportunity from time to time to, to be involved with our junior Matilda cohort or talent ID across the country um, and being on the grass with, with some of the member fed programs when I'm allowed to travel. So yeah, that's a bit of a nutshell of, of my journey so far. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Charlotte, can you share your journey? And just before Charlotte starts, if anyone has any questions, please pop them in the chat because um, I really want you guys to, to ask Debbie and Charlotte the questions tonight. Over to you, Charlotte. Cool. Thank you. Um, firstly, just thanks for having me and thanks to everyone for jumping on as well. I know it's a, I almost said Monday night, God, it's Tuesday. Um, so thanks for taking the time to come out and, and obviously listen. Um, I, I found it quite interesting when Ailey sent me a few questions um, to prep and one of them was to talk about my journey which I've never actually been asked so I had to think about it a little bit. Um, not as interesting as yours Debbie. Um, mine basically just started um, whilst I was playing. Um, I think I was playing at Nepean at the time and my now boss actually was, was working there and he you know, I needed some help with some holiday clinics. And that's basically where it all kind of started, which I forgot until today. Um, hadn't done any kind of coaching courses, had never coached before, had just played. I think I may have done um, maybe a workshop of some sort, but that was it. So it was the scariest day of my life when I first joined that holiday clinic. Um, but very rewarding um, and quite challenging, as I'm sure it is for, for anyone on, you know, their their first training session, game, whatever it may be. It's, it's quite scary, but it's quite a rewarding experience. So um, that was, yeah, quite quite a while ago. Um, I think 2014. Um, didn't do much until about 2016 when one of my friends uh, needed an assistant coach. Um, this was at Bankstown. I think it was Bankstown Association at the time, which is now Bankstown United. Um, just with GirlSat, which at the time was um, part-time, which was also an interesting experience. Um, you know, they would basically play one game with us on one weekend and then the following weekend they would play in the grassroots space, which I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it was it was quite an interesting season. Um, after that, they 
no longer wanted their license with with the girls sat, uh, which was unfortunate. But then I moved into the boys' youth space, um, so they're playing NPL two at the time. So going from coaching ten to twelve year old females to under thirteen boys is quite a different experience. Um, but honestly, I I probably learned it, not the most, but quite a lot just going from one extreme to the other in a sense. So girls that had basically never played almost um, to boys that, you know, had either dropped from MPL1 to MPL2, um, you know, had just come from SAP. It was, yeah, quite an experience. Um, I think I was fortunate enough to um, assist some some really good head coaches as well. And I think that's definitely what's helped me during this whole process. Um, I mean, I can only encourage you all enough to be assistant if you're not comfortable being a head coach because you honestly learn so much just from, you know, listening, learning, um, you know, asking questions, getting feedback. Um, so, yeah, my first year with the boys, I had one coach. Then the year after that, going up the age group, a different coach and just learn even more from there. So um, after that, just went back to girl stuff, actually. Um, so I just joined Football New South Wales um, uh, in terms of my – my full-time employment, um, so it was quite hard to go from there to Bankstown every day. So I moved to Blacktown Spartans and coached girls staff. Um, unfortunately, had to leave halfway through the season, but then was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to join the Football New South Wales Institute um, just the following year and was there for two seasons up until uh, now. And I don't know if anyone knows Nadine Shields. Um, she runs the whole program, so... I was lucky enough to assist her and again just learning so much from everyone around me and I think um, you know I'll, I'll keep saying it but I've been extremely fortunate to be surrounded by so many different coaches um, I can only encourage you enough to you know if you're with a particular age group walk over to another field after your session and and watch what a different team's doing and what the coach is saying and you know how they're I guess, delivering their messages because you learn so much just from observing others. Um, so, yeah, we had quite a good crew for the last two years. Um, you know, obviously I was with Nadine as well. We had Brian Dean as well around most of the time, which was good. Um, so, yeah, um, separate to that, in my last role, which is probably where most people know me, um, I was the Inclusion and Diversity Coordinator at Football New South Wales. So... My grassroots kind of experience was, I guess, uh, flowing whilst in that role for three years. I was thrown into the deep end a little bit, had no experience coaching, you know, um, people whose um, first language is not English, for starters, um, all abilities programs as well. I can see Bella on the call. So we've done some stuff together as well. Um, and honestly, that's probably the most rewarding experience Um I can probably share with everyone, not just in the grassroots space, but, you know, anything to do with inclusion-based football. Um, I think it definitely helped me in the elite space. So I was obviously doing both at the same time. So during the day, running programs, you know, for people with all abilities, and then I would, you know, come back to the office, walk downstairs and, you know, jump on the field with the Institute. So it, it honestly supported each other and, and it's just been, yeah, uh, a great learning experience, so to speak, but I'll stop talking because I, I tend to talk a lot. Eight. Really ready to jump in. I was going to say <laughs> two equally um, different but um, incredible stories. Um, and I didn't realise you coached into the boys' space. So I, I know a few have um, been coaching the mix, so I'm sure there'll be some good questions that come from um, the differences um, coaching female and, and male players. This is a, a hard one for me because I've actually been in some very male dominant coaching environments where I've been, you know, basically, um, I hate to use the expression, but one of the boys in a sense um, and quite supported and nothing was different, uh, which was excellent. But I know that's not the case everywhere. Um, I did have a few instances at one particular club um, where it wasn't the case. So um, I hate to say it, but if, if that's the environment that, um, you're in, whether it's in a club space, a program space, whatever it may be, it's probably not the right environment to be in. And I know that's not the, probably the greatest of answers, but 
it needs to come from the top and if it's not flowing down and there's no culture that's, you know, going against encouraging, I mean, sorry, supporting female coaches in those particular situations, then, you know, it's probably not one to be in. But I don't think that's probably um, the greatest of answers. Hopefully Debbie's got something something more useful. No, look, Charlotte, you've hit the nail on the head. If If you're not in an environment that's supportive, you're not going to flourish as a coach. Um, and if you have people, I won't say males because, you know, females can be just as derailing as, as men can. But um, I guess my only advice would be if you're having issues with a male parent coach or somebody in and around your community team, I just start off with just letting them know that you have actually done some formal coach education training, whether it's a grassroots certificate or an advanced course, it doesn't matter. But you're letting them know that you do actually know what you're talking about in a respectful way. And if they want to continue, you know, being over the top and, and pushing, I, like Charlotte said, it's not the right environment. You're not going to get support from, from the club around you. Um, and in, in my experience, having those sort of conversations is usually with, I hate to say it and I don't like to pigeonhole, but it's usually from men who have not played at a high level themselves. They've just played at a community kind of level all their lives, but they've watched football and they can name players and therefore they know. And by and large, they haven't done any coach education in terms of formal training. So it's just their opinion that they know more than you. Um, and, yeah, if you're in that sort of situation, get out because you'll never change them. You'll never change that mindset. Um, I'm going to jump in on, I guess, um, and I guess add to that, um, Bella. And I guess in terms of your association, um, if you have support programs um, to within your clubs, so CCC um, is a great point of contact for a, a female um, within a club to to reach out and say, hey, I think I could coach this team. Um, I can't get through to, to the current coach in regards to um, sharing the role. And um, these are the reasons why I think I would make a great coach. And um, can you support me in having a conversation? Um, um, and I'm ready. Because um, what I guess I've noticed uh, with, I guess, females is they need someone um, that's got their back. And to give them the courage to have that conversation, um, because the, the unless the environment is supportive or the individual is incredibly confident, and um, they will back away and 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 not put themselves out there. Whereas if you can create, um, I guess, um, support networks, so the CCC is a great program. And I guess hopefully from this network and working with associations that we have female coach mentoring programs, um, because I have that same thing. Like I'm a part of, I guess, the NSFA network. I have a mum that phones me and says I yeah, I feel like I get scrutinized more than the males and these are the reasons why the dads think I'm not doing a good enough job how do I handle it and they just have someone that they can talk to build confidence have the conversation in their head and out loud with you so then they have the courage to then have it with, with that male so I guess that's maybe something from a, a structure point of view that could help um your um I guess team managers and, and females because there's a lot of potential great coaches out there that just need the encouragement to to get out of that pigeon of team manager and, and move into that kind of coach role. From your journey to obviously Charlotte you've got a massive um I guess GSAT boys youth um, assistant at the institute level and um, your your all abilities and um, Debbie and um, obviously um, Junior Matilda's coaching in schools and um, you both obviously love coaching and um, can I ask you what is it about coaching that you just I guess really resonates with you and if you're not doing it you miss it Debbie first yeah um, connection for me, it's all about connection. And uh, I guess, again, if I look at my coaching journey, um, the first ever, here's a little bit of trivia for everyone. The first ever girls, uh, 
probably equivalent to a TSP program of today. Um, it was started at Football New South Wales with a bunch of nine to 12 year olds while I was at university and I was one of the two coaches that were, were uh, rostered on to, to coach the group of players one coach was male and, and I was the female coach. So I learnt a lot off him. He was older than me, more experienced. But at the same time, while I was at university, I was mentored by another coach and we were coaching the under-17 youth league team, which is like MPL1 now, uh, in the boys' space. So similar to Charlotte, I was kind of working with girls who quite new to the game and boys who have been playing for a long time and, you know, a couple of them have gone on to play for Socceroos and, and made careers out of it. So quite a diverse group. Um, the, what, the thing that I'll always come back to is connection with your players and just being in and around that environment where you can see through your connection and your language with each individual athlete, how you make them flourish, how you get them to achieve what they thought they couldn't achieve. And a, a great example is when I started with this girls' academy program at Football New South Wales, the director of coaching at the time came down on the second session and he handed each player a home training diary and it said, by the end of the year, you have to be able to do a 1,000 juggles these kids couldn't juggle once, let alone a thousand. And I just looked at him and went, yeah, right, no chance. But that was a moment of connection for us because I was useless at juggling as well. So we just worked through it together and we all, sorry, I won't say all, there were 12 girls, nine of the 12 got to a thousand by the end of the year. But it wasn't, it wasn't my brilliant coaching or the other guy's brilliant coaching. It was just that connection of, hey, how many did you manage to get this week? Let's have a juggle off, see who can beat who. And just seeing, seeing athletes uh, just blossom is, is what really, what I miss. Great, great answer. I'm a massive believer, connection before content. Yeah, your players uh, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, and when they know you care um, and you have that connection, then you can, like you said, um, make them flourish and then become the best players that they can be and to ultimately enjoy the game so they keep playing. What a great answer. Okay. Charlotte, how about yourself? Um, yeah, similar kind of response came to my mind initially and then, you know, as I thought about it more, I think we underestimate the power of football. I mean, just sport in general, right? But football is because that's the, the topic of the conversation. But um, it's, you know, it's a social thing. Um, it's connection again, as, as Debbie's already touched on. You know, in a, this day and age, we talk about mental health. Um uh, I'll always talk about the social thing, but it's also a vehicle for change, social change. It's everything. Like it's just the more you think about it, the more kind of crazy it is. And these are the types of conversations I've had pretty much in my last role um, in those three years. How can we use sport to, you know, connect people that, you know, are, are from diverse backgrounds, people that haven't played before, people from war-torn countries, um, you know, different players of, of different abilities, different disabilities, whatever it may be, it's, it's honestly so powerful. And I think that's what it was for me. Um, it was also meaningful, you know, prior to that time, you know, coaching boys, girl SAP, holiday clinics, development programs, that's, that's all exciting. And, you know, it's, that's the elite kind of pathway. But, you know, in the grassroots space, um, I like to touch on a few different things. It's, you know, it's the bond, it's the connection. It's kind of just everything you kind of want in a team sport really if you think about it um and another thing I also thought of was um I mean I I never had a female coach um I don't know if anyone else has been in that situation I was always coached by males um never had a, a bad experience um I just never was fortunate enough to have to have a female coach which is fine um but I think the the additional layer for me was why why can't I be in that position with the experience that I have to, you know, support females as well and have a female coach because I never had that. 
Um, like I said, and I'll always go back to, I never had, you know, bad experiences um, with the male coaches that I had. I just, it would have been, you know, a bit different if I had a female coach thrown in the mix as well. Um, you know, we're role models. Um, everyone in this in this meeting is a role model, so we should all take advantage of that if we can. Great answer. Um, and it's true, football, football can change your life. And, and as a coach, you play a huge role in that in terms of the confidence and, and uh, empowering um, your players. So, uh, great, great, great answers to both of you guys. Um, Charlotte, you talked about um, in your inclusion and your diversity role that you that you, I guess it was challenging. Um, a lot of it was new. Um, I guess coaching players that your first language wasn't um, uh, English or coaching um, players with disabilities. And I guess that was a new and um, I guess challenging um, environment to be in. Um, and I guess for female coaches, they face that um, quite often, whether that is to to put your hand up and say, hey, I want to be coach, not team manager, or I want to coach the senior team next year at the club, or to be honest, to come onto this call and be like, I want to be part of this next network and and then and, and put myself out there and meet new people and um, what advice would you give um to, to the female coaches on the call to to have the courage um to step into those kind of challenging situations yeah I think um we're all in kind of different situations looking at the chat where everyone's come from and you know we've all got different aspirations but I did notice a lot of people saying that they're coaching either their kids team or they're a parent and a player um, I think most of those situations um, you either get thrown in the deep end or you put your hands up as one of the two, I think, but it's always scary. Um, my best advice is to, you know, don't be scared to ask questions. Um, I generally uh, apologise before I ask a question because I do ask a lot. Um, anyone that knows Nads, you can ask her, um, you know, Brian, Jamie, Gomez, whoever it may be, I'm always asking questions. Um, don't be scared to, um, you might think that you feel annoying. And like I said, I apologize before I ask, cause I feel like I'm annoying, but that's how you learn, right? You need to ask questions to, to learn. And I think I touched on it before. Don't be afraid to, you know, walk over to another field and, and see what a different coach is doing because you honestly learn so much from different coaches. And, you know, I've learned so much from assisting different coaches, um, and being around so many different people, different TDs. Um, you know, also coaching not just a team setting or situation, you know, programs as well. So um, I think, you know, it's it's more than just in the football space. I think, you know, it's also nerve-wracking being at a networking event at work where you don't know anyone. It's, it's kind of the same thing, right? When you have to go up and talk to someone because you're standing there by yourself, it's, you know, I kind of compare it to those situations. So just... The best advice I was given, and I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but I was basically told to get over myself, um, which that was from a, an actual life coach. So um, I feel comfortable in saying that. And she basically just said, you know, if, if you're in a situation where you feel uncomfortable and you don't want to do something, just say, what have you got to lose? Just do it. Ask a question, put your hands up, you know, be in an uncomfortable situation because we don't, we don't kind of develop and learn when we're comfortable, so to speak. So um, that's probably the best advice I can give. Um, others will probably find it easier than others. We're all very different. Um, and like I said, it does depend on your environment. And, you know, back to um, the conversation with Bella, don't be afraid to, to move out of that environment to a, a more supportive one if you need to. Great advice. Ask questions. Um, 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 put yourself out there. And I guess what, what you have got to lose, to be honest, you're probably adding to, to the situation. Debbie, do you have anything to add on to that? No, I think that was a pretty comprehensive summary. Um, yeah, trust your gut. Trust your gut. If you if you think you can do it, do it. And don't have regrets. Don't look back in 10 years and go, I wish I. You know, just have a go. Have a go. And I guess like anything, if the more you, you practice, the better you get at things and the more you observe and read and, and ask questions, the more clarity you get. Um, and I guess the, the biggest challenge with community coaches or coaches who are just starting out their journey is you don't know what you don't know. 
So quite often you don't know what questions to ask. But if you can look at it from the perspective of, I want to know one thing that's going to help me, you know, manage a group of small players and start digging, start asking questions about that. And then once you get the hang of managing that group of players, all these other questions start popping in your head because now you've got a, a broader view of the game. So, yeah. I love I love that. Give it a go. And I guess um, if we ask our players to do things and we want them to have a growth mindset and we want them to try things and um, recognise that mistakes are part of the learning process, then to be honest, as coaches, as leaders, we have to model that behaviour. We're not expected to be perfect. Um, I guess that's something we've got to let go as females um, and actually celebrate our mistakes. Um, it's part of it. Just giving it a go and asking questions like uh, both Charlotte and Debbie said, and we learn from the process. I guess my biggest observation in, in the role that I'm in at currently is we don't actually engage parents enough on the journey. And although you, you know, most clubs will have that touch point with the parents and you know, these are the, you know, the requirements or training days or whatever, it's how engaged are the parents really to that player's journey? And if you can get the parents to buy into the why Sally needs to turn up to training every week because it's a team sport and, and this and that, then they become your biggest advocates and then they start doing the chasing around of, you know, ringing Sally's mum up going, hey, why wasn't Sally at training? You're letting the team down. So it takes the pressure off you as a coach or your team manager to do that. Um, so I think get the parents on board first. And from a coaching perspective, if the girls are learning and they're enjoying themselves, they'll want to keep coming back. And 14 is a tough, tough age, whether it's boys or girls. You ask any high school teacher, you know, year eight, nine, you know, nightmare. So the age group is a challenge in itself from that perspective of hormones, growth spurts, awkwardness, bitchy girl syndrome, you, know, you name it, you've got the whole lot. Um, so that's where the connection with each individual player is, is crucial, I guess, and knowing each individual and what makes them tick. But um, my personal advice would be bring the parents on the journey. Good one. Charlotte? Yeah, um, that's pretty much probably what I would have said as well. And I think it's, it's more so, uh, well, I guess it's more important because, like you said, the previous coach probably, I guess, let them do whatever they want, so to speak. So, you know, it, it's already kind of set up in a, in a way that they feel like they can do whatever they like. Um, I have been in a similar situation and it took quite a while to, I guess, show the parents and the players, um, you know, it's one big team, right? It's not just the team of players, it's the parents as well. They're basically their own team in a sense um, to understand what you're trying to do and why. And I think Debbie's already touched on it. She, she's explained it quite well, you know, explaining the why. Why do you need to be here? Why should you be here? Um, I've also spoken to a few people about a, a similar situation um, in the grassroots space particularly, and they've basically made it mandatory to have parents at training. There are obviously situations where, you know, you might have multiple kids. So, you know, you drop one kid at training and then you go home and then you pick up and then you go somewhere else. So that's obviously different, but where you can encourage them all to be there because if they can see what you're actually trying to do, I feel like that's the key as well. So, you know, obviously talking to them about it is is one thing, but if they can actually see it and see the changes and the progress, um, not even just the skill, it's the it's the bonding as well as a team. It's, you know, the social aspect as well. It's, it's kind of everything. So, you know, encourage them to be there. Make it a requirement if you like. I know it's quite hard in the grassroots space. Um, it's a bit easier um, in the, you know, the elite pathway because you can basically tell them they need to be there. But, encourage it as much as possible and just make it fun make the sessions fun because you know I want to have fun as a coach so why can't the kids have fun as well you know join in 
you know, if you've got two sessions in a week, make one have a, a different game where you're doing something a little bit more, you know, fun as opposed to skills based, but it can be one in the same, really. Um, that's probably my best advice. Yeah, and some good one. I'm actually going to just add on that, just in terms of, I guess, that experience in terms of fun. Um, definitely getting the parents involved, um, um, I guess, long term, because that's going to take time, especially if the previous coach um, has, um, I guess, let them off. Um, and then if you're saying that their skill level's low, then they're probably at that sap very much the individual developing the skills with the ball, dribbling, 1v1s. Um, and then regardless, if you plan your sessions for that, rather than worrying about the team and what the team's doing, you're, um, if, if six players turn up, that's not going to impact your enthusiasm as a coach. You're going to be like, right, I've got six six players and I'm bringing my energy and I'm making it fun and they're learning. And then... Um, the ones that have missed out are going to get FOMO and they're going to be like, oh, I want to come because they did. you did the session and then Nicole jumped in and it was great. And then next week you might get seven players and then you keep building that. Um, and then rather than being impacted um, or losing, I guess, hope because the number of players are, are, are dropping, um, I guess, bring that um, enthusiasm and fun, like Charlotte said. Yeah, I think we're in a, a time where, you know, academies and external providers are, are everywhere. Um, so we've got a few clubs that have similar, I guess, um, organisations that come in and do the same thing. Um, we have uh, an in-association program called the Club Player Program, which is delivered across, at the moment, just three different clubs. Um, obviously, all the clubs are different. We've got you know, some extremely large clubs that are self-sufficient and then we've got the smaller ones that need a little bit of assistance and um, some are in that situation where they just have our casual coaches come in and run the sessions. The parents are kind of there but kind of not there, kind of listening um, just around, basically just there to drop off and kind of be there. Um, and then there's another club where we have the same program but it's more specific to mentoring the coaches. So... Um, a lot of work is put in to help those coaches to run the session. So um, a, a casual coach might come in and maybe open the session and introduce it before that situation. Obviously, the, the parent who's the coach at the same time is introduced and kind of briefed as to what they're doing and then they'll take over at some stage. So it's kind of like they're the assistant coach in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so we have two different approaches and I guess it depends on the club, but I feel like something like that is probably more desired and probably useful um, for your club in particular. Um, mm. So, yeah, it, it, it'll have to be a conversation with whatever club you're with. I'm just going to ask Debbie and Charlotte um, to, I guess, what's your one um, piece of advice for, for these females tonight in regards to um, leaning on the support network and what they can get out of the support, uh, having a support network um, for, to ensure that they enjoy their coaching um, and, and, I guess, really get the most out of it. So what would be your advice? Your turn, Debbie. Uh, my first advice would be, you need to articulate what you want out of a support network. So a support network could be as simple as, can somebody just look after my other child while I coach the youngest one? There's, there's some support. Um, if it's support around your coaching and development, then it'd be looking at your club CCC, if your club has one, or a network like this. Um, finding a mentor, somebody who can you can bounce ideas off, and they don't necessarily have to be a football coach. They can be a coach of another sport. Um, any invasion sport, the principles are the same. Score more points than the other team. So, if you've got any uh, contacts with other sports that you can then just bounce ideas off. Um, Work colleagues or family support, again, you know, somebody you can vent at that, you know, they're not going to dob you in and go, oh, my God, that coach is a lunatic. But, you know, somebody you can trust or, or a group of people you can trust. And, and hopefully a network like this is, is a really good sounding board and a trusting environment 
people aren't going to walk away and go, wow, don't talk to that Deb Fisher, she's a lunatic sort of thing. You know, we're all here to, to support each other's journey. Um, so, yeah, probably number one thing is what you want out of your support network. If you can, if you can be clear on that, then you'll know which people to go and find um, oh, to support you. Great advice. I guess that just leads you to then being proactive if you're the one that's making the decision. Um, and I guess, like Debbie just um, outlined, there's so many different types of support network that helps you ultimately to coach. That's brilliant. Uh, Charlotte? I think, um, I guess, just initiating the conversations. I mean, you're all obviously here now, but, you know, don't be scared to reach out to any one of us. And um, I'm going to assume... Uh, it's probably for Sam or, or Ailey um, that the rest of the group have each other's contact details. Possibly. It's the plan, yeah. Yeah, we'll cool. So that you can all, you know, I don't know, a group chat. You know, we, we overkill it a bit, but they're quite quite useful. Me and Julia, we were in a, a B license group chat, which was, you know, constant, wasn't it? But useful, extremely useful. Um, and that was, what, a year ago? So that was a year ago and there's still messages popping through. So, you know, just shows the power of, you know, communicating with each other. And it's, I think these types of networks are bringing like-minded people together. So you're all here for a reason. So, you know, information sharing is, is so powerful. Um, you know, it's, it's where we learn everything. Just don't be scared to ask any questions. Um, you know, we're all from different associations, but don't be scared to, to go to someone else um, from a different association or, you know, a different club, whatever it may be, you know, if, if someone's not willing to share that information, then, you know, you've got a whole group of people here that's willing to help. So that's probably the best advice that I can give. No, it's great. And I, I you can see a common um, trend when it comes to Charlotte. She loves to ask questions. And I guess that's that's a part of her journey and um and, and learning and, and it's just vitally important. And it's um, you know, reach out, um, lean on people, ask questions. Um they, they will inspire you and um, you will learn and um, you will then go and inspire someone else. And it's just that collaboration it just has that knock on effect in regards to uh, we're all in the game um, to, to, to inspire um, our players to have a deep love and, that's, and have fun. Um, so I guess lean on each other to do that. Again, my, my advice probably moves a little bit away from what you want to hear. Because it's again about the connection piece. So I'd be probably looking at doing some kind of um, teamwork that's not football related, so that the team understand um, through other activities that you're only as good as the worst player in your team. And I and I mean that in a nice way. I don't mean it to be disrespectful. I'm, probably wouldn't use that language with 14 year olds but for the team to get better the weakest link needs to get better so if you can build the the teamwork and co team cohesion around why everyone needs to work hard to get better then you should find some natural leaders amongst your better players that will click and go okay I now recognise I need to work with Maddie a little bit more to help her get better so that we get better collectively. So it's not necessarily a coaching thing. It's more, again, about the connection, the teamwork around it. No, I like that. Charlotte? Yeah, um, that's definitely key to, I feel, any team sport, right? It's, it's got to be for the team. Um, you know, we always encourage creative individuals to, to do their thing and we don't want to limit that either. So that, that also comes into it. Um, one thing I probably learnt more so coaching people with disabilities um, because they're all, all on so many different um, ability levels um, with the groups that you have most of the time, particularly when it's, you know, in the school space, um, was giving or providing individual tasks to different players. So, you can always have a group um, session, drill, activity, whatever you want to call it, um, where everyone's basically doing the same thing. But if you've got, you know, say there's three or three to five of the players uh, slightly more advanced, give them a, a specific task. So, 
you know, don't be afraid to do a left foot only, a right foot only. Um, if it's a, a game, I mean, we, we kind of use um, cross the bridge a lot um, with all abilities, just as a, a kind of a warm up, so to speak. Um, if they're, you know, the ones that are speedy to get across straight away, you know, put them in first. Um, also, to be more inclusive, maybe don't pinpoint them like that, but give them challenges or, or in the opposite sense for those players that aren't as, um, I guess, skillful, give them live. So if they're getting caught out in a drill or a game, you know, three times in a row, give them 10 lives. So, you know, you're still in the game until you get to the your 10th life, so to speak. So don't be afraid to give extra challenges. I think that's probably the more useful one, but it can go the opposite way as well. Um, it's just being a bit more creative with, I guess, game rules is what, what it comes down to. Um, you can always achieve, I guess, team-based, um, I guess, goals within a session, but still focusing on the individual element. And I think, like Ailey said, in women's football, we're coaching girls that are on all different ability levels. Um, it, it doesn't matter if it's senior football or if it's girl staff or whatever it may be. It happens in the boys' space as well, but, you know, it's, it's all varied and we, we all have to handle it in different ways. But that's probably the one useful thing that I had to um, personally kind of come up with. And like I said, don't be afraid to be creative. Um, if you need specific ideas, you know, anyone that's on this call is, is happy to help because we've all been in that similar situation, I think. Yeah, and I'm going to, I guess, follow in in terms of, um, I guess, the, the dip, to be a great coach. I think the great coaches um, look after the team, but then can also coach the individual within the team environment. And they can challenge or, or build confidence or depending on the players that they've got. So they, they go back to Deb saying connection and then recognising what motivates the players and what they need in terms of their development. And like Charlotte said, have those individual constraints um, and really challenge and, I guess, um, praise. So uh, if, if a player ca can only juggle three and she juggles three, then you're celebrating that like it's the World Cup because so she's got a new record. Whereas if it's another player who's really good, finally, um, um, you know, does a skill rather than just rely on her pace in a 1v1 situation, you're celebrating that or you're giving points for that. You're, you're really catering to that individual to keep them engaged um because they see a value in themselves because as much as a team sport um you know players want to to feel valued and looked after and i guess that individual coaching in, in the team environment allows you to do that and it, it's required because until the depth and um, between the top player um in terms of experience and skill level and the bottom player shrinks a little bit in the female game um coaches are then required to, to upskill themselves to be able to coach the individual. Um, so, um, yeah, lots, lots of things that can go into that um, and workshops and stuff. So can definitely um, provide more resources for that, Maddie. 